History buffs of Reddit. What is a piece of history that often goes overlooked despite being very interesting or funny? That time Liechtenstein sent 80 soldiers to war and they made a friend so they returned with 81. The American Hippo Bill. During a meat crisis in 1910, some American legislators wanted to introduce African hippos to the southern wetlands so we could all enjoy Lake Cow Bacon. Obviously, the bill never passed. Romans believed in other people's gods goddess. So when they would attack a city they would pray to the god gods of said city to abandon the occupants and support the Romans instead. If they won they would give the god a special place in Rome or completely incorporate it into the state religion. Also the ancient Greeks did not view it as gay or straight they saw it as dominant and submissive. In short they had no concept of being gay. Cargo cults. After World War II. Some tribes in Pacific Islands got their first exposure to civilization when US military bases would be set up. The military would bring supplies and food with them which the villagers liked. When the war ended, cults formed that built new runways, mimicked army drills, and even built straw planes to try and bring back the gods that gave them food, medicine, and supplies. Alboin, King of the Lombards took his wife Rosamund as a spoil of war after he killed her father in the Lombard Jepid War. Then at one point he made her drink from her father's skull, which he kept as a trophy and fashioned into a mug, telling her to drink merrily with your father. She had him assassinated. He comes up now and again on Till, but for all the history about World War II that is often banded about in the culture at large I had never heard about the fascinating double agent Juan Pugil Garcia. Also known by his codename, Garbo. The story. Juan was from Spain and had become disgusted by fascism. He wrote letters to the UK and the US saying hey, I'll spy on Germany for you guys. UK and US said nah, we got this. Juan said to himself I'll go ahead and spy anyway and posed as a Nazi loving Spanish govt, official to become a German agent. He was assigned to spy on London but instead went to Lisbon and made up phony reports based on English magazines and newsreels. After a while, the UK realized someone was doing a jolly good job diverting Nazi resources and took him on as a spy. He worked throughout the war, with Germany funding his totally real network of not at all imaginary spies. He was responsible for diverting many German troops during the invasion of Normandy. He was also awarded medals by both the Nazis and the Brits for his work. During the First Sino-Japanese War, a Chinese admiral pawned one of the main guns on his flagship to a scrap dealer, in order to pay off some gambling debts. This was the same war where the Empress embezzled from the army to fund her palace renovations. When Cortes conquered the Aztecs he had 10 feet 000s of native allies who were more than eager to help because the Aztecs used them as slave and sacrifice farms. Cato the Elder, a Roman senator would give several vehement speeches, all ending in something along the lines of Carthago de Lender Estate, roughly translating to Carthage must be destroyed. Carthage did end up getting destroyed a couple years after he died. Years later, Cato the Younger was on the Senate. Julius Caesar was reading a note during a meeting, causing Cato to accuse him of being a spy. After Caesar denied the accusations, Cato asked Caesar to read out the note, because if he really was innocent, he wouldn't have anything to hide. Caesar agreed. It was a love note from Cato the younger sister. Furthermore, I think Carthage should be destroyed. The time a pope dug up another pope's skeleton, put it on trial, found it guilty, had it rebreed, dug it up again, and chucked it into the river. Edit. Well people seem interested so here's an abridged version of the cadaver synod. Still, read the wikilink and sources. Crazy time in papal history. So, Pope Stephen V. I really hated the guy that was Pope before the guy that was Pope before him. Acker Pope Formosus. I believe their relationship would be called Pope twice removed. That line will work on two levels in just a second. Anyways, so Steph super hated him. It was pretty much all because of powerful families and politics and grudges. Still, Pope is a literally lifelong gig. And that means the guy he hated had been dead for a bit by the time Stu became poop. So what did Stephen do? Why he dug up the ultra dead previous pontiff and put his skeleton on trial of course. He was found guilty, stripped of his garments, had three fingers removed, 
they were his blessed fingers, was redressed in peasant garb, and rebreed in a pauper's grave. This didn't feel like enough for all Stevie V. So he dug him up again and had him chucked into the Tiber River. Stephen V.I. was then imprisoned for the whole thing and later strangled. History. The time a 340 year old museum piece was used to repel an invasion. The Dagnalls Operation, 1807, was a fairly minor skirmish during the Napoleonic Wars. The Ottomans aligned with the French against Britain and Russia. The British sent a fleet to intimidate the Turks and force them to reopen the strait. As the British fleet sailed towards Constantinople, French engineers worked with the Turkish army to repair and improve shore defenses. Part of this included reactivating a 340-year-old super cannon, modeled on the one used in the famed Turkish conquest of Constantinople in the 1400s. This cannon weighed 17 tons and fired stone cannonballs that were 2 feet in diameter. After meeting little resistance from the Turkish fleet, the British were forced to withdraw after taking heavy damage from the shore batteries, including from the colossal Dardanelles gun. TL. DR. Trebuchets are nice, but can they fire a 360 kilogram projectile over 2400 meters? In Bernal Diaz del Castillo's The True History of the Conquest of New Spain he mentions that a priest died during his time with Cortes. When searching through his stuff, they found a leather dildo. Another funny incident, they held Montezuma hostage in modern day Mexico City. While a hostage, he still had gold and was a king, so he was treated half decently. One of the Spanish guards accidentally farted in his face. The guard was embarrassed and apologized profusely for humiliating a noble. To show there were no hard feelings, Montezuma gave the guard a gold piece. The stupid guard then farted again hoping to get another gold piece. The Kettle War. The only casualty was a soup kettle and the soup inside. The Savior of Paris. Paris as we know it may not exist today had it not been for one man. During the German military occupation of France in World War II, Paris became the capital of this occupied zone. While France moved its own capital to Vichy to keep the state alive. During this time Paris saw no real bombing or fighting and remained relatively unscathed, compared to London or Berlin by the war's end. However, the commander of Nazi-led Paris, General Dietrich von Choltitz was given orders by Hitler to blow up the bridges and level the city should it be overtaken by the Allies, as he would never return it to them the way it was. Within a month the Free French forces liberated the city and Choltitz had famously ignored Hitler's call. Is Paris burning? The general grew fond of the Paris during his short time there and recognized its immense cultural and historical importance. So today he is remembered as the savior of Paris. How the actual call from Hitler went, or whether or not it even took place is debated. But we do know that if Choltitz had not grown sympathetic, we may have lost some of the best parts of Paris. Read more on it here. The Aztecs are overlooked in most history classes. But they were far from the primitive tribesmen that most people think of. At the height of its power Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Triple Alliance, was rivaled in size by cities like London and Constantinople, and it was all built on a giant artificial island. It's a shame their culture was obliterated, because though they might have been a bit too obsessed with sacrificial killing, they were an incredibly fascinating civilization. The Sea Peoples. I am totally fascinated by them. I am currently reading 1177 BC the year civilization collapsed by E. H. Klein. It focuses on Egypt, who really was the only civilization to withstand the sea people. My history buff friends used to think it was funny that my favorite war to read about was the war of 1812. There were cannons fired over the Niagara River. There was a battle in the middle of right outside of New Orleans. Detroit was surrendered because Isaac Brock managed to trick them about the size of his army by running around in circles. The same Isaac Brock died in the middle of battle. His horse kept going until it was shot and killed. The presidential mansion got burnt the duck down. The same troops that destroyed Washington DC saluted Mount Vernon with cannon fire and refused to damage it because it was named after a British guy. The troops that burnt down DC were eventually defeated by a hurricane. The British sailed into Lake Champlain and there was a massive naval battle there. The British literally tried to reconquer America and the Americans genuinely tried to invade and take parts of Canada. 
The War of 1812 is the most baddest war that Americans forgot. Lots of people know it happened but the details are incredible to think about. Hundreds of US communities started using their own currencies during the Great Depression in order to bypass economic downfall. Of course there was the Dust Bowl and other factors at play, but it generally worked. Sometimes, it's as simple as stepping outside the systems that are in place. Some of our problems really only exist on paper. The Byzantine Empire, or the Eastern Roman Empire or whatever you would call it, all of it, all the stumbles, all the resurgences, not to mention all the meaningless disasters. Any nation surviving for 1000 years from the Dark Ages to the start of the Renaissance has served well in its time, all things considered. The Boston Molasses Flood of 1919. A horrible way to die, yes, but it's still so weird. The US government, JC Ocean DoD, drafting ideas to bomb US cities targets and blame it on Cuba to influence American anti-communism interest and to start a war against Cuba. This happened within the lifetime of generations still alive today, yet people for some reason assume the government would never commit or attempt to commit such atrocities and label open-minded critical thinkers as conspiracy theorists for believing it could be potentially possible. I will preface this by saying our sources from the time are sketchy at best, so this may not have happened, but I digress. We all know Charlemagne yes, king of the Franks and all that, well. While he did a great deal for the Frankish legacy, he wasn't the first independent Frankish king. That honor went to a guy named Childeric. And this dude must have been fine as duck because his sexual escapades are insane. So Childeric was actually king twice, but he never got usurped, nope. He was instead exiled. Not for killing anyone or it like that. Just because he ducked so many of the Frankish nobles' wives. Genuinely. The sources tell us he was banished because all the lords realized that their wives were all cheating on them with the same dude. And so told the king to duck off. So he duly did. And ended up in the court of another barbarian king as an ally to him. During this time, he got into the royal court. Got chatting with the king's wife. And you guessed it. Diddled the lass. Following this. Rather than keeping it a thing on the down low. Childeric straight up declared that he was marrying the wife. Ran off with her and brought her back to the nobles that thought they were finally rid of the horny bastard. Fortunately for women everywhere, this queen seems to have had a bit of metal. Because nothing else is written about him running off with any other important women. Instead he had a son, a lad named Clovis, and thus began the rise of the Frankish Empire that spawned modern day Germany and France. So two modern European nations have a grandfather who was just a massive horny duck. If you read through the wikipedia of serial killer Albert Fish it's really messed up the crimes he committed but one pretty random hilarious thing stands out. He began to have auditory hallucinations. He once wrapped himself in a carpet, saying that he was following the instructions of John the Apostle. Jack Churchill, as per wikipedia, Lieutenant Colonel John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Jack Churchill, DSO and Bar, MC and Bar. The 16th of September 1906 or the 8th of March 1996, was a British army officer who fought throughout the Second World War armed with a longbow, bagpipes, and a basket-hilted Scottish broadsword, nicknamed Fighting Jack Churchill and Mad Jack. He is known for the motto, any officer who goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. It is claimed that Churchill also carried out the last recorded longbow and arrow killing in action shooting a German co in 1940 in a French village during the Battle of France. The Toledo War, a border dispute between Michigan and Ohio that almost broke out into armed conflict between the state's militias. Ever wonder why Michigan has the Upper Peninsula when it logically should be part of Wisconsin? The Toledo War is why. More than when Plato gave Socrates his definition of man as featherless bipeds and was much praised for the definition. Diogenes plucked a chicken and brought it into Plato's academy, saying, Behold, I've brought you a man. After this incident, with broad flat nails was added to Plato's definition. George Washington's bar tab. It was a farewell celebration in his honor. The site mentions the number of guests as well as what alcohol was stocked. You think that night you went clubbing and puked on a bouncer was partying hard? George Washington and his buddies would have laid us all under the table. 
President Andrew Jackson beat up his would-be assassin with his cane and had to be pulled off by Davy Crockett so he wouldn't kill the guy. Pink wasn't always a girl's color and blue a boy's color so in fact. It was once the other way around. The distinction of blue for boys and pink for girls didn't take full hold until the middle of the 20th century. Look at this. Photo. If your first thought is that this was a Jewish prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp somewhere in Europe, you'd be wrong. This was actually taken in South Africa in 1901 during the Anglo-Boer War. And the person in the photo is a 7YO Boer girl in a British concentration camp. She later died from malnourishment. That's right. The British had concentration camps before the Nazis. If I remember correctly, the Nazis actually got the idea from the British. Disagree with me if you like but I think World War 1 gets way overlooked. In the USA at least. I think it's because World War 2 was a conflict with much more American involvement and a clearer cut version of good versus evil. I'm not trying to say it's a popularity contest or talk down any importance of any events in either. But I will say I think World War 1 and its plethora of technological advancements gets a little less press. Attila the Hun had a son named Erp. He also left this son absolutely nothing, dividing his kingdom between three other sons. So he got no inheritance. And a hysterical name. I thoroughly enjoyed hearing how kamikaze pilots would crash into things to terrorize and damage them. However, this wasn't as effective as they thought. Unfortunately and hilariously, the ironic problem was that nobody was able to go back and report that it wasn't working that great. I'm going to say European kings named Charles. The Charleses in France had an unfortunate tendency to be labeled with less than complimentary epithets. Charles the Fat, Charles the Bald, and Charles the Mad. That always tickled me. Also King Charles II of England was a badass. Ever been to a pub called the Royal Oak? That is named after the tree Charles climbed to escape the roundheads when he was fleeing the Civil War. Top quotes. I always admired virtue but could never imitate it. In response to his brother's concerns about assassination attempts on Charles II, I am sure no man in England will take away my life to make you king. When Parliament questioned his aptitude for kingship in Parliament, I'm definitely the best king in England at the moment. My favorite story which I love to tell people is during the Battle of Verdun, World War 1. The Germans outfits would get ruined that his helmet spikes falling off. So fast forward to some high up German commanders coming to visit them. The soldiers are scrambling to look good for them but alas, their helmets are ruined. So what do they do? They carve potatoes into a spike and stick it on their heads. Always makes me laugh. Here is an interview with one of the soldiers who mentions it as well. World War 2 Ghost Army Regiment. Allied force who recruited from art schools and theater. Used deception tricks such as inflatable tanks to deflect attention and deceive the enemy. Both insane and genius at the same time. So the first printing technology was carving entire pages of books onto wooden blocks then stamping all the blocks onto paper to produce books. This was extremely time consuming because of all the carving that was required. In addition, these blocks only allowed you to reproduce one particular book. Still, it was an amazing technology that allowed people to pass on stories and knowledge. People became more educated and intelligent. To this day, still one of the most important inventions in history. Then, someone came up with the idea that instead of carving entire pages onto blocks, why not carve single letters and use those letters to compose words and sentences. That way, not only do you do less carving, you also get way more scale and can produce any material you want. This simple idea to go from carving entire pages to just letters? It took 400 years before someone came up with it. 400 years. The average life expectancy at that time was around 40 years. That's 10 generations. Lifespan doesn't mean generations. Of people who have come and gone before someone realized there was a better way to do things. For reference. First books were printed around 650 AD. Invented in 1040 AD. The defenestration of Prague, the Thirty Years' War, one of the most devastating wars in early modern Europe, started when a group of Protestants tossed a couple of imperial delegates out of a window. The delegates survived the 70-foot fall because they landed in a pile of manure. The Hawaiian Kingdom, 
especially King Kamehameha the Great and King Kalakaua. I sadly know many that believe that the Hawaiian Islands were never a nation, when in fact one has to wonder where they would be today if the United States didn't annex them. Kalakaua was the first king to circumnavigate the globe, and the Iolani Palace had electric lighting and plumbing before the White House. There was even a point where Hawaii boasted a higher literacy rate than the United States and Europe. But, we'll never know now. Masalani nearly wiped out the Mafia, but the American government brought them back to power in order to help fight the fascists. During the Second Punic War, Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, repeatedly outsmarted and decisively beat the Romans. To the point that many Romans honestly thought the end was near. It wasn't until Scipio Africanus was made general that the war turned in their favor and they won. The interesting part, some time after the war, Scipio visited the court of the king of Syria and met Hannibal there, and the two of them had a conversation. Scipio asked Hannibal who he thought were the three greatest generals of all time. Hannibal replied that Alexander was the greatest, Bullus was the second best, a slight jab at Scipio since Pyrrhus fought Rome in the Pyrrhic War, and Hannibal himself was the third best. Scipio thought this was an arrogant answer, since Hannibal had been beaten by Scipio but still thought himself a better general than Scipio. Scipio asked how high on the list Hannibal would be if he had managed to win the war. Hannibal replied that in that case, he would be even greater than Alexander. I like to think of it as a sort of indirect compliment. Sort of sweet almost, edit, almost forgot. After the war the Senate accused Scipio of misappropriating war funds, which he took offense to after everything he had done for Rome. He stayed salty about it until he died, and his epitaph read ungrateful fatherland. You will not even have my bones. Pretty badass. There was a word that American soldiers used to call medics over to them if injured. World War II, over in Japan. The name Talula was chosen due to the L sounds and the name. The Japanese pronunciation of this was noticeable. Not nearly as noticeable as them yelling medic. Which was done by the Japanese soldiers to lure American medics over to kill them. Anyway, I wrote a poem about this history tidbit in college. And I think it will always be one of the least suckiest things I've written. After his presidency, Thomas Jefferson went back to Monticello, but people kept showing up at all hours, wanting to talk to him. He'd let them in for a chat, but it became such a burden that he built another home, Poplar Forest, to get some peace and quiet. I guess he never considered turning people away. It is very widely speculated by historians that the main reason Robert E. Lee was defeated at Gettysburg was because he was suffering from severe diarrhea. Lee is known as one of the most brilliant military tacticians of his time and was rarely beaten by strategy alone. Any time he was on the scene, it was an almost guaranteed victory for the South. Beyond Lee's brilliance, the North didn't have too many notable generals speak of and replaced replace generals often, making it hard for the North to have a consistent plan. So it didn't look like there was much hope for the North at Gettysburg. During the battle, Lee made a lot of uncharacteristic mistakes that ultimately led to a northern victory and turned the entire war in favor of the Union. These mistakes puzzled historians, because they were so unlike him. So they began to look at the journals of the officers who were with Lee during the battle and found that all of them described Lee leaving the tent often to relieve himself and being very sweaty and unfocused. Thus many believe he kept leaving because he was itching his brains out. Andrew Jackson called John Adams a pimp. You know what? All of it. Every single ducking last drop of history is amazing and interesting and hilarious. I could go on for days about Cressy. Or why Absinthe isn't hallucinogenic in the slightest. Or what the ducker Norman actually was or why I actually shout at the screen when a medieval English king has a flirty lies on him. But just jump in to find a point and it's all so rich and fascinating I'm getting misty. Go. Learn. Have fun, and don't believe everything you read. Marjorie Kemp, 14 15th century self-appointed holy woman of King's Lynn. No one wanted to write a book about her and she couldn't write herself. So she dictated it to someone because damn you, she was very holy and deserved to have a book written about her. The end result is that you get all her, ahem, quirks and unique theology without it being watered down by someone trying to make her fit a mold. All of it is gold, but a couple of my favorite bits, 
The time she went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and the other pilgrims she was traveling with ditched her because she was getting too into it and ruining their holiday. The time a piece of the church roof fell in during a service and landed just on her. She was knocked out but goes on to describe the incident as proof that Jesus loved her the most because it didn't actually kill her. The multiple times she was accused of heresy for being just a little too much into Jesus. I love her so much. Woolly mammoths and the pyramids coexisted. Ulus's S. Grant got to catch up with his friend and groomsman best man. Depending on the source, James Longstreet's at Appomattox. The happy reunion was because Longstreet was a Confederate general. Robert Liston, for whom Listerine is named if memory serves, is the only person in history to have performed a surgery with a 300% mortality rate, meaning that three people died from one operation. The patient died of gangrene. Liston cut the fingers of his assistant who also died from gangrene. And he literally scared an onlooker to death by cutting his coattails. This was back when anesthetics were non-existent and speed made a bigger difference. The Greek stoic philosopher Chrysippus died of laughter after watching a drunk donkey trying to eat a fig. The Second Seminole War. Black Seminoles played a very large role in wars between Florida and the US. It's an epic fight that ends with a US Army commander emancipating all of them about 30 years before the Civil War. It's basically Braveheart only with Chief Arceola as Mel Gibson, Andrew Jackson as the King, and Black Seminole Warriors instead of Scots. For more, go to johnhorse.com. In grade school I learned that Rome fell in the 400s. Then in high school, I learned that that was only the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire. Byzantine Empire survived until 1453. Then in college I learned that the Tsars of Russia, the kings of Spain, the Holy Roman Emperors, German Kaiser, various rulers of Liechtenstein, and probably many others have all claimed, at one point or another, to be the last heirs of Rome. So it's not entirely clear when if the empire is was finally done. My favorite trick question is now, when did the last Roman Emperor die? Mark Twain and his buddies decided to join the Confederate Army. It was an excuse to get away from the wives, hang out in the woods, and drink. This went on for a couple of weeks, until word came that the Union Army was advancing. Shortly thereafter, all the men quit their made-up unit and headed home. During World War II, there were sightings up and down the eastern coast of U-boats. Hemingway heard there was one off of Key West and decided he should hunt it down. He and a couple buddies loaded up a boat with booze, guns, and grenades. They were unsuccessful, and returned home shortly after the booze ran out. 26th of September, 1983 Russian early warning systems detected what they thought were nuclear launches from the United States. One man, Stanislav Petrov, deemed the reports a false alarm and decided not to pass the information to his superiors. Should he have done so, the USSR probably would have launched a retaliation against a non-existent nuclear attack, which would have prompted the US to launch its own retaliation. 27th of October, 1962. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, a Russian nuclear submarine thought it was under attack, as a US ship was dropping practice depth charges near it in an attempt to force it to surface. Flotilla Commander Vasily Arkhipov was the sole officer against the use of a nuclear torpedo. Had the sub launched the torpedo, the US probably would have retaliated. Had either of these men not been in the right place at the perfect time, we probably would not be alive today. The misconception that Aryan means blonde and blue-eyed. The word itself comes from Iran and India. The Confederate flag as we know it was never actually the official Confederate flag, which went through three different designs. Instead it was the battle flag of General Lee's army, the Army of Northern Virginia as well as a later design for the Confederate naval jack. Edit, links and more information.